Good. We got the green light, so we might kick things off. So the reason we're here today is AgriWeb did a webinar a couple of months ago with, with Jeff and Rob, and we did a case study on two ranches, um, one in eastern Colorado, uh, Flying Diamond Ranch, and one in Texas, uh, McFadden Enterprises. And it, it was we got enough positive feedback, and uh, coming to uh, Nat GLC, we decided to recreate this webinar or recreate with a couple of different panelists. So my name's Kobe Buck. I grew up on a ranch in eastern Colorado called Ray Ranch. I will be talking about our ranch and what we do. We're kind of early on in that journey to, we're, we're very much holistic, but early on in that journey when it comes to full region and taking new initiatives when it comes to grazing. In addition to growing up and working on the ranch, I'm also the U.S. account manager for AgriWeb. AgriWeb is a digital ranch management software. Uh, we have a booth if you're interested to stop by, but you'll see a couple of maps here where we're really looking to marry financials with grazing, with livestock performance, and treat our ranch just like any of the ranches I'm sure anyone out here manages. But um, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, we've been out in Eastern Colorado for five generations. Um, our ranch, Ray Ranch, is located on the Colorado-Nebraska border about 180 miles east of Denver, uh, so right there on the eastern half, and we uh, run primarily a cow-calf operation, but I will kick things off um, and then hand it over to Aaron, who runs in northwestern Nebraska in the Sand Hills country, and then we'll look to have a discussion with, with Jeff and Rob about each operation, about what Jeff has been doing um, with Texas A&M and, and the focuses for producers across the country and how we approach sustainable grazing, regenerative grazing, and, and uh, really improve our grazing across um, the range and across the country. But, oh, let's see here. Got to figure this out. There we go. So, Ray Ranch and a brief summary that, about our operation. So, we're primarily cow-calf. Uh, I would say commercial Angus is our, our, our design. We run, as of right now, about 800 pairs across 10,000 acres. Uh, we're a pretty lean operation. It's uh, full time. It's my dad and my younger brother who are uh, the, the two main employees, and uh, I work with AgriWeb but help out, um, especially during the busy seasons. And then my other brother might help out time to time. But we generally want to run our operation ideally at one uh, or 500 head for for one employee and be lean when it comes to the labor structure. The forage is highly variable in our country. Uh, so average, I would say 1,700 pounds of, of dry matter per acre. Uh, and, but really, I mean, what is average in our country? We have three different types of ecosystems that we manage under, um, and I'll show you kind of the different designs. So north of Highway 34 is kind of the junction and the entrance into the sand hills of, of Nebraska that anyone would be familiar with. Uh, south of us is uh, some buttes and some canyons that run um, further south, and it's just the Great Plains, the High Plains of southeastern Colorado, of Kansas. And in the middle on our operation, we have a river valley, which is about as wide as a car. I mean, it's not much of a river, but it's a, the Republican River out in eastern Colorado. And so that allows us a pretty unique design. I mean, we're not just managing a ranch that's uniform in its soil type or uniform in its design. Um, we're managing three different ecosystems in this one ranch. And thus, we have to adapt our grazing and pl plan out our, our rotations in a way that complements the wildlife in a way that complements the general soil structure, how much forage we have out there. So we do a little bit of everything. It's not quite perfect. If you have any questions or feedback, I would love to hear about it. So, I mean, just to start off with pictures, um, this is the picture of my back porch looking north um, into the sand hills. It's not as it's not as choppy or it's not as massive sand hills as I'm sure Aaron's area is, but uh, it's it's great country. Uh, it's we have about 50% of our ranch in the sand hills type of country. It's unique because we can't get too intensive when it comes to uh, our grazing. We can't have super high densities because when it comes to uh, sand, if you if you hit it a little too hard, it causes blowouts. You lose topsoil, and it's a huge uh, degradation of the soil. Uh, in those areas. So in this area, we have kind of the, the old school-ish approach of a wagon wheel system. We've been deploying that for north of 30 years. Um, typically, it'd be 
five or seven to 10 day rotations with herd sizes around 200 head traveling through upwards of 20 different cells that they rotate through across the ranch. Um, that's in the north 50% of our operation. Here in the middle, uh, we have roughly five to seven miles worth of, of riverbed. We have a couple of neighbors in between, but this is more product productive land. It's somewhat sub-irrigated and the forage here and the paddock design that we have at our ranch is somewhere between 100 acres and 50 acre pastures. And we start looking at our grazing designs of three to five day rotations is ideal for, for that riverbed. It allows adequate rest and recovery, and we can have multiple grazing uh, ses sessions in each pasture over the course of, of, of that area. And then finally, you go south of Highway 34, and you get this kind of wild, loamy clay, uh, hard ground uh, that looks um, uh, pretty three-dimensional. So this is the most challenging ecosystem, I would say, to have a, a real rotational or intensive high density, uh, low duration grazing system. We have many challenges when it comes to water. Um, our pastures are, are close to, I mean, sections or, or uh, 750 acre pastures. So they're a little bit larger because we're restricted by just the geographical design and the topography of this land when it comes to subdivisions, but also water. We have a, in this pasture right here, we have like a three acre pond um, that's a, a, a natural spring that feeds into it. Um, but that's really the only water source that we have in that area. So it becomes a, a different challenge and different ecosystem in which we, we graze upon. Um, so we get a little bit of Kansas, we get a little bit of Colorado, we get a little bit of Nebraska, all right there on Ray Ranch. And it's a fun place to work. It always keeps you thinking and experimenting with new ideas on, on the best way to approach each e ecosystem. Um, so here's kind of the ranch as it lies. In addition to uh, the sand hills are up north, uh, these pastures here are the, the canyonist pastures. We also do have some hay ground. We have about 200 acres of alfalfa. And then these three circles or windshield wipers are um, 300 acres of irrigated grass. I think the irrigated grass side of things is where I really get excited about um, high density, low duration grazing. Um, I think right now we can really kind of take some step forwards and subdivide some of these pivots. Uh, still haven't figured out quite the best way to map those out and build that out. But looking at that, it starts to become a fun little challenge where uh, do we start to diversify from the cow-calf operation and start leading into uh, backgrounding or running stalkers, retaining our calves and running stalkers on that irrigated grass and on that riverbed bottom to, to maximize um, cheap gain, but also to encourage um, these multiple session grazing events across these more, um, these more lush or productive acres. So that's generally what we're thinking about. Um, and so the way that we wor work here, this north pasture uh, wagon wheel is a, is a good example. I mean, four or five different pastures broken into 150 to sometimes half section pastures. Uh, we typically stay anywhere from seven to 10 days in any one of those pastures. If it's a half a section, it might be a little bit longer, but um, ideally have adequate rest and recovery. So a typical craze would start off kind of down here during calving and some smaller pastures. And once those calves are good, we, we rotate all the way through these pastures and then come back down through the sand hills. And, and depending on our kind of adaptive design, um, we might revisit a couple of pastures that have had adequate rain, but it's more so what the rainfall is and reacting to that. Um, we have experimented uh, with winter grazing. I think I'm a firm believer in only winter grazing about 10% of your pastures or 10% of your acreage, especially if it's in the sand hills, because I mean, sand is such a fragile soil type that if you graze a little too hard or if you don't get those timely rains, uh, it can put you back pretty quickly and back in the, not just a couple of months, but a couple of years. So really being conservative on winter grazing and making sure that there's always residual grass to cover it and protect that soil from blowing away. So in brief, uh, we run 10,000 acres, 9,500 of those acres are native grassland, 300 acres is improved irrigated grass, 
200 acres is um, a couple of alfalfa stands, either irrigated, flood irrigated, or uh, sub-irrigated that allows us to be fairly self-sufficient when it comes to our hay requirements, although we're always looking to decrease that, that supplemental feeding. Um, when it comes to the cattle we run, we either run commercial Angus or uh, Angus Hereford crosses on our maternal design. We're really looking for a moderate framed cow that can get out and hoof it miles a day and produce a calf every year. So really 1,200 pounds, 1,250 pounds is our, our ideal mature weight. And then on the terminal side of things, we, re we produce some replacement heifers and we're growing that. Um, but on the terminal side of things, we really like the, the quarter simmetol when it comes to our terminal animals. It seems like it's a great, great way to balance that moderate maternal design with what the market has been valuing uh, an animal that can have a little bit more growth and to, can get to a, a 1,500 pound finish weight. Uh, in Colorado, uh, our county is Yuma County. It's right kind of in between the corn belt and the cattle belt. So it's where there are a lot of cattle feeders, um, like of which I think Five Rivers, the, the Yuma yard is right about 25 miles away from us. So um, a lot of big cattle feeders and they like to feed um, a lot of animals that are, that are black that um, have that growth to them because of the carry economics when it comes to uh, just lower corn and, and delivering highest, higher carcasses uh, and whatnot. On the ranch, when it comes to wildlife, this is one thing that gets really fun. I mean, we have a diverse range of wildlife. So we have both muley deer, deer and white-tailed deer. white tail kind of hang out south of, of Highway 34 with muleys in the Sandhills. Uh, we have some rear grain turkeys. We have some pheasants. The pheasant population on the ranch has gone from, uh, it's quadrupled, I believe, since when I was six or eight years old. It's really cool to see that. Of course, some coyotes, uh, some prairie dogs, I, I left those out. Uh, and then some waterfowl, geese and duck. Uh, so uh, we, we look at it and I think in addition to just raising cattle on a sustainable design in each one of those ecosystem, really aligning with, um, with the wildlife there and ensuring that I mean, we're raising cattle, but we're not taking advantage of the wildlife and the other ecosystems and, and sacrificing the ecology of the overall system is a major priority of ours. Our average precipitation, whatever average means, is about 17 inches of rainfall. Uh, you're either too dry or too wet oftentimes. So it comes in high volatility and it really kind of makes it unique when it comes to managing for drought. Uh, typically, I mean, what we're starting to move towards when it comes to managing for drought is always be conservative on your grazing um, and not just coal opens, but also when it comes to prey checking, sorting based off of cycles and sorting based off of age. So if you do come into an event where it's persistently dry for, for three straight years and you have to start culling, bred cows have been doing their jobs every day or every year for the last four or five years. We typically look at age plus or minus where their breed cycle is. And anytime we cull, we look to cull and, and still maintain the ideal calving situation for our group. So, I mean, to, we'll start with the late breads and cull those to, to maintain kind of a 60 day calving window. Ideally, we want to get to 45 day calving window and our cows primarily calve April 15th to, to June 15th, I would say would be our typical cow. Um, calving season. It works out well in Eastern Colorado. Eastern Colorado is susceptible to some pretty nasty winter or early spring storms where you can get in a bind when you're, you're um, calving in the middle of March. So we feel like calving with nature, kind of being able to bring those calves up and align it with the, the forage capacity and the forage availability on our ranch re really works well from uh, a production standpoint on our cattle. Um, some initiatives that I think that were this, I guess on the left is a brief design of the, the, the way that, and how we manage and, and focus on our grazing rotation. So in the sand hills, our stock density for any one grazing event would be about 0.5 to one is our ideal target. Um, and depending on the acreage, depending on the forage availability, we'll flex that, uh, of course and we'll look and target 120 days rest before we revisit any pasture. 
on the river bottom, we have smaller pastures, a more productive land, and we push our stock density up for any grazing event to 1.0 to 2.5 animal units per acre. Um, and they're quickly in and out of there. So we can um, allow 90 days of recovery before we revisit that. Um, and then the South Canyon area, which is the most challenging ecosystem to really manage from a grazing perspective, we're really forced to have a 60 day grazing duration because they're large pastures. It's, it's tough to move in and out of, it's tough to subdivide. So we'll typically get grazed for 60 days, pull them off, allow 60 days of recovery and revisit some river bottoms and, and some more plush areas. But the stock density uh, becomes pretty light in that area. So we're running cow to every 10 acres to, on average there uh, for 60 days and then coming back 60 days later. So it's one cow to probably 20 acres if you look at we're grazing half the year. Um, so that's generally how we've managed the grazing design for each one of these uh, cycles or, or, or uh, ecosystem types. Some initiatives that we've been doing. My younger brother went to TCU Ranch Management and came back with a couple of cool ideas. I think one of the cooler ones that he brought back is he throws a couple of hands of, or a couple of handfuls of clover in with, with the mineral on the sand hills. So it's just a small project. It doesn't take but half a second to throw a handful of clover in there, but it allows hopefully these cows to be vehicles for germination um, and to increase some, some legume structure in our native grassland up north. And hopefully in 10 or 20 years time, we can talk about a, a decent population of some legumes that will increase the productivity of the rest of the native grass structure. We don't want anything to be super improved. It does not scale to outright plant in the sand hills of Nebraska. Uh, but uh, looking at this, just doing a, some small kind of micro ecosystem improvements, I think will help the ecosystem as a whole. Um, in the root river bottom, we're really looking to deploy in the next three to five years uh, more permanent subdivisions. I think our ideal pasture size will be right around 35 or 40 acres and be able to subdivide that into 30 plus eight, uh, pastures just right there on that the, the river bottom so we can quickly cycle through. And it's a very easy grazing system to manage because there's always gonna be water in that river. And so daily moves, um, a move every one or two days, I don't think is off the table and it'll be a fun um, type of grazing system to approach. It's back to the basics over in the South Canyons. Um, I would say building out water infrastructure, um, really kind of allowing us to, to maybe throw one or two fences in will, I think, drastically improve our ability to manage that area. Um, on the irrigated grass, I didn't speak a ton to it. I mean, because it, as of right now, I mean, we have, we have three uh, pivots or, or um, three windshield wiper designs, each one ranging from 60 to, there's one that's 60, one that's 90, and one that's, or one that's 60, one that's 100, and one that's um, like somewhere in between um, with a little bit of flood irrigated supplementation. But we're really looking to subdivide those pivots. I think um, Jim Gurish is a guy that I, I look at when it comes to, to pasture subdivisions. And I think that looking and deploying a tactic like that um, on these pivots will be able to increase productivity by 20 or 30% at minimum in the next three to five years, but largely it could go north of that pretty quickly in the next decade. Across the ranch, because of these different ecosystems, we're kind of scattered out. Um, we ideally want to start running larger herds. So right now we run somewhere between, I would say six and eight, maybe 10 herds at a time. Um, that's a lot of overhead. That's a lot for a, a lean labor source. So being able to consolidate those into three or four herds, the average 250 or 300 head would be pretty ideal for us, our situation. When it comes to tools um, that we use, if you don't already, um, I think the first one that's very paramount that I work with on our ranch directly and then also through AgriWeb, I consult a lot of um, ranchers that are just starting to get into improving their grazing design, but the NRCS Web Soil Survey is a great resource to start just from the basics. I mean, if, if you're really starting to look at rating your pastures and the land and the productivity from a pounds of dry matter per acre perspective, 
you can see three different ratings based off of precipitation. And we'll break down the estimated capacity of that soil um, based off of each soil type and each kind of precipitation horizon. So I use this almost weekly um, between AgriWeb and, and our family ranch. And it's just a great tool to kind of see what the soil can handle. And then we start looking at management and precipitation and we get closer to that, that, that question of, okay, what's, how much grass do we have out there and what's the best way to manage it? Um, on the AgriWeb side of things, so I joined AgriWeb almost two years ago and it wasn't because uh, I was really looking at ranch management software is really to, to join a company in that area is really from the ranch perspective. And I looked at it and I'm like, well, some of these, uh, I mean, my dad graduated from Colorado State in the 80s. I think Excel came out in, I don't know, the late 80s. And it was something that you never really took to very well. So it became a little bit more difficult to take those physical records that he has in the calving books and in his mind and, and scattered all across gloves and, and pant legs and everything else and really make sense of it. So when we were looking at the best way to grow and adapt and kind of understand what we have, um, I found AgriWeb, which then led me to uh, help launching AgriWeb in the United States. And it's a great way to manage our financials, our direct costs when it comes to feed, our pounds fed, but also it's a great way to capture animal unit days per acre, animal unit days, per pasture, track rest and recovery. Uh, it's really helped us, um, especially with transparency sake, knowing what needs to be done, how to do it, and be able to see the impact of having to feed that bill of hay, not just on the forage, but also on the bottom line. Um, so we use this religiously. I'm not just touting that because I work for AgriWeb, but if you want, to tout, if you want me to tout it, you can stop by the booth. Um, a couple of things on the horizon that we're really excited about. Um, AgriWeb was originally founded in Australia and for the last three years in Australia, Australia seems like it's the hub of ag innovation, unfortunately. We'll hopefully switch that tide over. But um, SIBO Labs is a satellite company. I think in the cropping world for the last four or five years, um, SIBO Lab, or there, there have been satellite companies to measure corn yields or soybean yields, but uh, when it comes to modeling that for native grassland, the, the algorithm and the math and the colors are quite different. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. You can take a picture and get a good sense of, of your native grassland. SIBO Labs has been focusing a lot on native grassland satellite imagery. And I think that this is a huge game changer for producers across the country, being able to have an accurate satellite picture on a five-day basis to know exactly how much grass is out there. So we've been working with them. We're, we're are personally on our ranch looking to pilot this next year as they fully kind of launch in, in the United States and really have a, a real time view of just how much grass is out there. And then another item that we're considering either game cameras or uh, RanchBot. RanchBot is a rain gauge and a water tank sensoring company uh, that you can move with the cattle and be able to get text messages or uh, satellite reports doesn't need cell phone service, but get updates on a, a daily basis, an intraday basis. Whenever that water tank goes to 25% and your ears start burning, um, this will give you an actual real-time report on your, the water levels, lowering the, that, that labor need, but also being able to uh, monitor areas where you might not have as much water. I think that this can improve not just grazing, but the overall dynamics. Also with that rain gauge sensor, being able to see how much rainfall in each pasture is something that we're very interested in because there aren't a lot of clouds in Eastern Colorado. So a couple of pastures might get half an inch of rain while the rest of the ranch is completely dry. But that's it from me. I will hand it over to Erin so she can talk a little bit about flying A. Thank you very much. Well, he's a hard act to follow. Um, my name's Aaron Martinez, and currently I live in the Sand Hills of Nebraska, Hyannis, which is uh, about 60 miles east of Alliance or 60 miles north of Ogallala. Um, I am a 
Southwest Colorado native. I'm a mountain girl. I grew up um, in a non-agricultural family, but was dropped on my head as a child. Had this need to ride and this love of agriculture. So that led me to go to school and become an ag teacher, but I didn't do that until I was 30. Um, in my young adulthood, I had two beautiful girls and uh, their dad and I uh, ran an outfitting business in the high country. So um, I've got a pretty diverse background, um, but I, I taught ag then for nine years in Olathe, Colorado, and really enjoyed that. Then my girls got ready to go to college, and I thought, I think I'm gonna go do some stuff. So I, uh, I cowboyed in uh, Montana and Wyoming, and then that led me to spending some time in Idaho and Northern Nevada with Simplot. And so Simplot's a massive, their land and cattle section of their corporation um, is 4 million acres. They run 26,000 head of mother cows and have a feedlot of about 110,000. Um, during my time there, I wanted to immerse myself in different um, segments of the cattle industry. Uh, because that wasn't exposed to me in my upbringing. Um, so I had a little stint in the feedlot, and then I worked with the research herd, which Kobe and I found out we have some ties there. And, uh, and then I was offered a job to do range monitoring. And uh, we had to monitor these public grounds um, in a way that we could be, um, save our butts, really, you know, because what the BLM might come up with or the Forest Service on their monitoring and, and what I was doing, you know, I might push a cows, push cows out of a 20 mile pasture and then go right back with my ruler and do some utilization. But it taught me a lot um, about understanding our native species and the pressures that we put onto them. So um, having all of that, then I met this guy and then we ended up in Nebraska. So it's kind of been like moving to Mars for me. It is such a unique ecosystem. It's all native um, around our area. Nothing's cultivated. You would never want to break that topsoil. Um, you can see areas that it was broke, um, you know, during the times of um, the Dust Bowl, of course. And so they've got some go back land and that's been taken over by um, a lot of uh, little blue stem and grasses like that. Um, so I had to jump right in and, and figure out this new ecosystem that I lived in because I had been spending a lot of time on the back end of cows and now I had to look at what was going to come into that cow and make all these decisions about, you know, what, what are our grasses and our soils lacking? What am I going to have to supplement with her with? Environmental part, you know, does our cow here at the Flying A that I have nothing to do with this herd that, that has been there for a long time? You know, how am I going to, um, you know, make sure that they're the right cow for our operation? So, um, yes, and when, when I was asked to speak, I just love the title of that. Isn't that all of our goal? To get more green from the green with being sustainable. So um, the, the Flying A Ranch was established in 1898. That big house was built as a hospital but then the railroad ran 10 miles south instead of through this valley. So um, it, was, it was purchased by the current owner's family in 1913. Anne is a fourth generation owner of this ranch. At one time, it was 50,000 acres. It's really massive. And now it's um, down to close to 15,000 acres. Um, the dumbbell, we kind of call it, has three divisions. We've got headquarters where Tom and I are at, the Quinns across the highway, and uh, Tom's son, Tyrell, and his wife are there. And, uh, and then we have Survey Valley, which is 17 miles north of us, and that's our summer country. Um, and as I said, we, we have been, uh, been there for three years. So this kind of gives you a, a look at, um, that's a, using Google Earth, kind of a 3D view of, of what 19 million acres of the sand hills looks like, really. <laughs> you know, it's, it's these dunes, interdunes, and then these sub-irrigated natural meadows. Um, the star is where our ranch sits. Um, that's up on top of one of the hills looking down at, uh, at our headquarters. And I think I walked off with my piece of paper, without my piece of paper. Yep. Appreciate it. <laughs> so when it comes to, um, Grazing. When we got there, I think things had been done 
the same way for a really long time. It's kind of like, we're going to do this how Grandpa did it, because that's how Grandpa did it. So we've tried to think out of the box, and we were really, really lucky to have an owner that is receptive to that. That's not, that's not typical a lot of the times. But Tom and I treat this ranch as it's ours. These are our cows. This is our land. And we want to do the best for Ann. So um, of our entire ranch, as Kobe was talking about breaking it down, we have about 13,800 acres that are our native grass rangeland. It's either a dry meadow or an interdune or the big dunes. And so that's very typical of what you see of our landscape. It's just this kind of, it's just sand dunes covered in grass. Um, here's an example uh, Kobe was talking about with you know, problems of having a blowout. So er erosion is a big, a big concern for us. Um, so our production on a normal year is about 2,200 acres on that native ground. Little blue stem, sand blue stem, prairie sand reed, Scribner's rosette grass, needle gra or needle and thread, and switchgrass. Um, some other forbs mixed in, um, and it, uh, you know, is, is very resilient. We've we currently have somebody doing a study there, looking at our cool and warm season grasses, um, and tying that to what our soils are able to, um, you know, how they're supporting those grasses. Um, our 30 year average precipitation is close to 20 inches a year, a little bit higher. And uh, the degrees is 47.3. Um, I think the average wind speed is usually 11 miles an hour if you just looked at it for the whole year. So um, coming from the mountains, it seems like it's always windy there, but I have a new definition of breeze now. That's about 18 miles an hour. So, um, but if we didn't have that wind, We've got no water, okay? So um, I have a new appreciation for that. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about our, our grazing strategy for the ranch, it was very much when we got there was continual grazing. I'm gonna stick, you know, 115 pair over here in this pasture and I'm gonna leave them, you know, and they'd be there from June until I weaned in October. You know, now was it necessarily overstocked? No, I think somebody paid attention to that. You know, was the water available enough? Yes. But the pressure year after year after year on one pasture to be able to support that. Now in, in these large pastures that we have, which range from 500 to 2,000 acres, um, you know, now we're getting into looking at days and rest periods and all of those things. So last year, for instance, I had three herds of 125-ish, 150 pair, and, uh, and I had two or three pastures that I would rotate them with. Because I'm learning more every single day. That's why we're all here. I'm not standing here to say that what I'm doing is right or wrong. It's, it's just I'm excited to be learning and to have this um, you know, this ranch to, you know, seeing if it's really working because we're boots on the ground. So last year I made some changes and this year I'm going to make even more changes. And so those cows were in a pasture for typically 30, 45 days and then might get moved. And, and all I was doing was I, I grazed this pasture first last year, you know, got the most out of those cool season grasses. And then the next year or the next term or rotation, I went to this other pasture. So then this next year, I'll start with that pasture to give the other pasture a rest on our cool season grasses. Well, this year what I'm doing is I'm going to increase our herd size. I did have to check out my water availability for that. We do have some natural existing lakes around um, so that if I, <laughs> what he was just saying about that technology, or I might have to not drive up and check windmills and it's just going to come up on my phone, you know, get your horse. But uh, we do have some natural waterways in some of our pastures. So when it really gets scary, we can move our cattle onto, you know, some fresh water. But um, this year I'm looking at being in a pasture with 250. So now I'm just going to split my 500 cows in half. But I'm adding, you know, I went from having seven or eight pastures for all those girls and a rotation with four herds of maybe two pastures. So now I'm going to have four or five pastures to rotate them. So I'm, I'm, I'm shrinking my time period 
and I'm increasing my stocking density into it. And then I'm gonna get off of it, go to the next pasture, go up, and then come back and, and start again with that. Keeping in mind that every year that I do this, you know, we'll be giving pastures a break on if they're getting grazed at the hottest part of the summer or for cool season grasses. We're excited to get to the point where we're gonna be able to give some of our pastures a rest. Um, and you know, that, that's really important for us to be able to do that, but we're just not quite there yet. You know, you can't solve all your problems right away. The show must go on, but we're making changes as quickly as we can. Our sub-irrigated meadow production, we have about 950 acres, and um, we have four, four meadows. If you're from Nebraska, they're meadows, but <laughs> for Colorado, they're meadows. <laughs> um, and we put up round bales, um, and it, uh, it produces around 4,500 pounds of, of forage a year, and, uh, and a little bit higher. Um, I also utilize a uh, web soil survey through NRCS. I've got 17 soil types on our ranch. That surprised me. I was like, it's the sand hills. It's all va Valentine sand. But you get into these sub-irrigated meadows, of course, your organic matter is increasing, and um, you're gonna have a little bit more diversity in your plant species. So we, we have to hay because it's what mother predict or mother nature tells us to do about June, July 15th to August 15th. And the, we have to do that because the water table goes down enough. Because if you go in there with a tractor and you break that sod, you just sink. And it takes a lot to get you out. So I would like to be able to hay at different times of the, of the summer or the growing season, but we can't. You've got one cutting. Everybody's in the same boat, all hands on deck, and you go in and hay. Um, we put up about 2,150 bales off of that ground. Um, round bales, our round bales weigh about 1,400 pounds. We're able to sell part of it, and, uh, and the, of course we feed part of it. Um, we've had good hay crops so far. We haven't had any kind of a shortage. We've had excess. We always stockpile at least another five to 700 bales at all times over what I think I'm going to need. And on a year like this, a winter like this, um, you know, neighbors are all gonna depend on each other. And we don't wanna pr price gouge somebody because we could be in that boat, you know, the next year. But uh, once, once we do the haying, of course, nothing's in there. It regrows. I measure that regrowth. And then somewhere in, in November, I kick uh, our weaned calves out there. And so the gentleman that bought our calves this year, um, we sold them, preconditioned, sold them, and now he is paying me 98 cents a day to keep those calves. And I'll retain those calves all the way until September. So going back to making, how do you get more green from your green? It was a cow-calf operation because that's how we always did it. And the inputs, as you know, on cows is tremendously high. Our country is, is low in phosphorus. Phosphorus is an expensive additive to your mineral package. Um, it's low, our hay is about 7.2% crude protein. And so you, you're going to have to supplement, especially as you get into that first trimester, or third trimester, I'm sorry, of pregnancy. Um, and also we get enough snow that covers up the ground. So, um, you know, we, we wanted to lower our, our cow herd size, which we have to be careful for because we still need borrowing power. The owner does. You, you know, it's nice to get out of that because you, you lower your risk, but you still have to have those assets to be able to function properly in the business sense. So we started looking at, you know, how can we bring in some yearlings? And that is big stalker country. Um, and, you know, it, it really appealed to Tom and I because there's no risk, not much risk for us. We don't own the animals. He provides all the vaccination and mineral and things like that. And then we just, you know, we doctor them and run them and, and uh, utilize our grass that way. Um, 
uh, going off of what Cody, Kobe was talking about, uh, herd size, his family's been in this a long time, and they really have had a plan and some goals of how they wanted their herd, you know, the, the size of their cows to be, to lower their input costs. For us, we got there, and it was, it's, there's some big girls, especially coming from the desert, you know, out in Idaho and all that, where those girls might travel 15 miles to get to water. And our cows, they are so spoiled, you know, they, they don't have to go very far. There's no rocks, you know, there's no mountains, anything like that. But it's, they were raised there, that's their environment. Um, our cows are usually about 1,350 pounds, uh, commercial Angus herd. Um, bulls, bulls used to be just a, the bulls that were there at the ranch when we got there were a commercial Angus bull. Um, and they went all the way up to nine years old. And nobody had any EPD data and nobody knew what the heifer bulls and, and, and the cow bulls were. So that, I was pretty nervous about that. So we quickly, as quickly as we could over three years, culled bulls, made the right choices on where bulls needed to go. And now we lease bulls. And we lease bulls all out of Colorado. And I found a niche because in Colorado they test Rafstopolis, Diamond Peak, they test their bulls for pulmonary arterial pressure, um, if they're going to get brisket, brisket disease or not. Well, I started thinking about this with my friend George Rafstopolis, who uh, his family owns the ranch, and I said, what happens to your fallout bulls? What happens to the bulls that don't pap well? They're still amazing bulls, great genetics. They've got sim angus, half, half sim angus, quarter sim angus, and, and then angus bulls. And these bulls will travel. They were born in the sagebrush, and they're going to hunt up the water. They're going to hunt up the cow. They're not lazy like a lot of Nebraska bulls are. <laughs> you know, because that's their environment, right? So I'm wanting to bring something in that's really going to want to work for me. So um, we've, we've worked out something with Rafstopolis's, and next year all of the calves are going to be um, Diamond Peak calves. And he's very interested in buying our calves, having us run those calves for him. He has a feedlot that's close to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. So always be thinking outside of the box. How can, if I make this one decision, how can it possibly become profitable, you know, in the long run for your ranch? And it's, and it's about making those relationships. Um, we no longer raise our replacement heifers. I can, I can buy them for cheaper than what we can raise them for right now. Um, and, uh, and again, I said that we <clears throat> added a stalker, uh, a stalker enterprise to our ranch to diversify. Um, on how we handle our animals, and this definitely goes into grazing. We talk a lot about our livestock. Well, let's talk about four wheelers and trucks and those things that are going out there on your land and, and causing disturbances. For us, we can make blowouts, you know, when cows trail on the same trail or uh, bulls. You know, bulls make the bull holes and then it just expands and we have blowouts as big as this room. So we do everything horseback and that's where the real joy of it comes for me because I like to rope stuff <laughs> and, uh, and ride and work our cows. Our cows, you know, work w really well with, receive our horses well because we've trained the cow. As you know, cows can learn whether you're on foot or on a four-wheeler and you're you know going out and changing your fences your electric fences on a very intensive grazing rotation you know cows are not dumb they're a creature of habit and it's how you treat them and adapt them to your own environment so um, we use our horses um, for pretty much all of our operation and i think that's kind of a cool picture that was last last winter trailing cows home and i i think we had cows strung out for like two miles and that's a gr good group of cows. You know, it's, it's you know, not just an insane mob of out of control black cows. Um, so that brings me to AgWeb. And we recently just got on there. I'm working on my master's program. And this summer I had to do a PowerPoint and it was about technology and agriculture. How could, you know, what would I recommend to producers to embrace technology into the ranch. And it's here, <laughs> We've, we need to embrace it. It's, it's really um, going to improve your efficiency. So long story short, 
AgriWeb was one of the ones that I was looking at. I called Ann, our boss, and we were very excited because Ann and I have had a hard time coming together and getting to the bottom line. What is our unit cost or production? Ann's family has some debt. There's a trust involved. There's money going here and there and everywhere. So as an outsider coming into a family, there's just sometimes some questions that you don't ask, right? I'm providing the inventory and the expenses and those kinds of things. But when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of unit cost of production, we can't quite get there. But we've got to get there. Or we're not going to get out of this hole that has been created from doing the same wrong thing for a long time. So when I approached AgriWeb and learned more about it, that, that not only am I going to be able to fine tune with Kobe the important things of a grazing rotation and, and knowing exactly you know, that my land's forage production is in my program. It's unique to me. I'm not just another customer. But I can track that and I can track expenses. I'm going to preg Monday when I get home. And I just can, she's bred, you know, she was dry. You know, we notched her, we gave her these vaccines. Those costs are taken right out and go to my unit cost of production on that cow. So it's very, very exciting. Um, but I was most interested because of the grazing aspect. You know, the, I, that's what it looks like on my phone. You know, so this over here is the Quinn, of course, our Meadows headquarters side and Survey Valley, 17 miles north. And think about the possibilities if, if they are able to add that, that my northernmost windmill, something's wrong with it. And I can go check it because it's going to alert me. So, um, and, and kind of the last thing I want to talk to you about is thinking not just about what the land can do for me and for our cattle. How can I be a good steward to the land? So um, we have a lot of wildlife. We do allow some people to come hunt, but it's very limited and we do charge them. That's nice added income for the ranch. Um, we, I mean, of course, sandhill cranes. We actually have elk in our area now. It's a limited hunt, but we've got muleys, antelope, whitetail, sandhill cranes, pelicans. And that's really strange. Um, but we have so much groundwater. We have little, little ponds and lakes all over the place. Um, NRCS, we work with NRCS a lot. We utilize um, the, the opportunities that we have for equip programs and CSP programs. Um, for instance, there's a new tank uh, up in that uh, corner of that slide. And so we went and we banked it. And because of our erosion problems, we'll just put those kind of half bales of hay around it and let the cows just go and rub on it and knock it down and then create you know, some stability in that soil. Um, and then the picture in the middle, that's, that's my ranch or headquarters side, just as Kobe had shown, um, using web soil survey. That's going to tell you exactly what types of soils are there. Um, in the future, it's something I want to start doing is um, testing our soils, getting soil samples. Um, and we already, you know, we already test our hay. And then I also do monitoring on my own end. NRCS wants me to do a little bit of that to fulfill some of these programs, but I'm, I'm creating in my own Excel document and photographs to you know, show what, what my utilization looks like you know, every time I come out of a pasture and go to those same photo points and take pictures in the same direction with the same horizon to see change over time because I'm not going to be at the flying A forever. And so I want to create a succession plan and a lot of history for Anne and whoever's going to be her next manager. So I think that's kind of a wrap there. Warren, Kobe, thanks. Those were great presentations. It's, it's, um Take taking your time uh, and come sharing what you're doing doing on your own operations so we all can learn. Uh, my name's Rob Cook. I'm the director of, of business development for Bamert Seed Company, a native seed company in Texas. We 
uh, produce native, native grasses and forbs and legumes, and then sell them back out as custom blend for, for reclamation projects of all kinds. We have a cow-calf herd that we do run on those production fields. And uh, we also uh, run stockers on uh, when, we, when we have uh, annual, a annual crops in, in those rotations. Uh, formerly, I worked as a, as a consultant for the Noble Research Institute and worked for NRCS. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm gonna introduce Jeff Goodwin here. Jeff and I are gonna kind of have a conversation. That's kind of our goal here is have a conversation about so, some of the ideas and the principles that we just saw that, uh, that are being deployed in, in these operations. Jeff, tell us a little bit about where you're at now and, uh, and a little bit about your history. Thanks, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Goodwin. My family uh, operates a small uh, cow-calf operation on both sides, um, uh, 150 head or less on both sides. Um, interestingly enough, that's pretty much the majority of most beef cattle operations in the country. I mean, when you start looking at it, most of them are smaller acreage um, beef cattle operations. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not here uh, to talk to you about how well my stepfather and father-in-law listened to me, because that's really <laughs> not a thing. Um, but uh, when we uh, step back, I've had the, the privilege and the opportunity to work with guys like Rob and work with NRCS across my career. And I spent the last six years at Noble Research Institute working with some really, really great um, landowners, um, just working through some really good successes and some wrecks. Um, and so some of those people are here today in this room staring at me. <laughs> and so um, that's nerve wracking. But uh, the, the opportunities to, to, to get to, to work with them and know them and, and experience the, the, the good times and the bad and, and, and learn every step of the way. It's been a humble blessing uh, in my life. And um, I guess with that, um, I moved on to Texas A&M University and um, looking for some exciting things there. So happy to be here with you today. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, we'll have a few uh, uh, opportunity for some questions for the panelists here, kind of here at the end. But Jeff, I, I had a question for you. Um, we talked. We, we we heard both our presenters talk about the practices that they're employing, and we've heard a lot of uh, talk and a, a lot of discussion about regenerative ag. And it seems like regenerative regenerative grazing. Um, some it's, some folks are, are might might be a perception around that it's a, a new idea, a new processes, but it's really not a new idea, is it? No, no, it's not a do. Uh, it's a new word. <laughs> it's not a new thing, right? I mean, when, when we step back and and look at what is the foundational sort of principles behind uh, regenerative management, regenerative ranching, regenerative grazing, however you want to sort of frame it. Um, it may be new to some of our perceptions, right? Uh, but, but functioning ecosystems is not new on planet Earth. And so what, we're, what, what is new is our, our focused paradigm around working with nature instead of against her. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, as we work with, with operations and, 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 you know, developing sort of a holistic goal and framework, um, even that word, at times is has gotten people sideways holistic what's wrong with that word i, I want to think in holes i want to understand how that when we when we open the gate and let that set of heifers in how is that going to affect the water holding capacity of the ranch how is that going to affect the bottom line how it's 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 understanding how when you make a decision to do x on a ranch how is it going to what are the what are the intended and more importantly the unintended consequences of things that are going to happen as a whole, but from from a regenerative perspective, it's all about it's all about making uh, you know making decisions that 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 that, that grow the ecosystem and, and ecological functionality of, of the property. It's not new. Um, we've just put new words around it at times, and <clears throat> it's, it's you know from a rangeland perspective, we've been working in these systems for a long time and working with these ecosystem processes. It's now that you know, we've, we've tried to move away from some of the production practices on cropland that those principles are now being employed in cropland systems. And so that's a little bit new, but. 
I, I think what, it, what else is maybe a little bit new is <clears throat> kind of historically when we think in conservation, we think of, in terms of practices, implementing yep. practices. You implement this practice according to standards and specs, and you're going to get this expe expected outcome. And, and I think we've, it's, that hasn't worked. <clears throat> we've got to start thinking about using practices as a toolbox to manage our ecological processes. Yes. And, 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 and not have an expected outcome. Hopefully we have an expected outcome. We have a plan, but we, we have to uh, monitor those outcomes and, and look at, at what they are. Um, what sort of information do you consider when you're advising a, a new producer, a new client about uh, maybe new to ag, new, new to grazing, or even new, a, a new idea uh, that they're looking to implement on their operation? You know, NRCS has a, a nine-step conservation planning process. It's a lot of steps, right? You gotta get started first. And uh, anytime we've worked with producers from Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, wherever, um, it, it's, it's about understanding, somebody said it earlier in an earlier presentation about, you, I think it was um, uh, Kim Barker was saying, you got to know where you live, right? And so everybody, every producer has a different ecological context. They have a different economic context and they have a different social context, right? What is their quality of life goals? Because those quality of life goals are just as important as how much grass you grow and how many cows you can run. And so taking all three of those under, and understanding the contextual components of all those and then, and then really defining what do you want? Because I find that, that more and more when we get to working with, with especially newer producers, they really don't know what they want. And so helping them understand the, the playing field a little bit, um, and it, it doesn't come from me nine times out of 10, it's getting them in peer groups and learning from their neighbors. They're gonna learn way more from their neighbor than, than they ever are from me or any other person from a uh, university or the government. And so if we can get like-minded producers together at a kitchen table talking about what those goals and objectives, the pitfalls, the successes, that's really where we make, make headway. But I would say define achievable goals. And then next, um, step cautiously forward, but step forward. Um, you know, I, I think oftentimes we get really excited about certain things and we jump in with both feet without really truly thinking about what is going to be that next step. But you got to take that step. Um, there's also the, the, you know, the person that's going to sit there for three years and strategically plan. <laughs> and at some point you got to make a step. So um, good plans and good people. And I, I really appreciated um, <clears throat> when Erin was discussing the development of your of your grazing program and what you're doing. You know, she didn't say we got there and we we're doing the same old things. So we subdivided every every six pasture into eight additional pastures, and now we've got 96 pastures and we're rotating through it. You know, she she got started. She took that step. She's eating that elephant one bite at a time, and uh, you know, you get into and just a big a train wreck jumping off and, and, and doing something that when your animals don't know the, the program, your land doesn't know the program, and, and we really don't know the program. So make those changes and evaluate what they are and then use that information to make, make the next change and continue to get better. And I, <clears throat> there's, um, there's always the uh, peer groups, that I, I love that, that's where people learn, but there's always those misconceptions. You sit at the coffee shop long enough, you hear some of these misconceptions. What are the ones that you hear the most throughout your career about grazing and grazing management? Um, <laughs> that, you know, when, when we start thinking about grazing management or ecology and ecosystem principles that we, we we often look at the literature, the scientific literature, the, 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 the science is the easy part. The science is the easy part. It's the people part that gets, that makes things a little more difficult when, uh, because, because each of us are different and our own, our own experiences develop our own biases towards certain things. And those biases tend to um, lead us toward our own sort of paradigm. And what's that create? Tradition. Right? Tradition can be a great thing as long as you're working on the same playing field that you were 
100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago. Most of us are not working on the same playing field that our grandfathers started the operation. Um, our cows are bigger. We have more brush. Uh, we have you know, maybe less rain, what, whatever it is, it's not a different, it's not a, it's not the same thing, but, uh, but there's some, there's some common things. Uh, one misconception is, um, I hear it all the time that I can't do this, uh, regenerative thing because I have to move my cows every day, or I can't move my cows every day. Right. Um, so and this is my opinion, right? Um, I don't think you need to move your cows every day. You don't have to, I'll put it that way. Anytime, being regenerative is about being adaptive, right? It's more about adaptively managing than anything else. So anytime someone says you have to do it this way, it's, they're probably wrong. <laughs> um, it's it, being prescriptive in agriculture is a recipe for a train wreck. And so <clears throat> uh, being adaptive and, and it's not about moving cows at all. It's about managing the timing, intensity, frequency, and duration of the grazing event. That's all it's about. And so once you can understand in your system, in your context, how long do I need to graze? How intense do I need to graze it? You may very well need to increase the stock density on a certain parcel of land to reach the, a specific goal or objective. But I don't have to do it tomorrow if that's not my goal. And so it's a misconception that I have to be pulling hot wire and moving cows every day to be regenerative. That's not true. Um, by the same token, another misconception is that, uh, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use that, those high stock density times because it's too much time and effort. We've worked with people that have, that have cows in every pasture and the time and effort that it takes them to go see those cows every day. When if they're in one herd or, or at least less herds, we can we can move a hot wire and in, in, in 15 minutes they're on on fresh ground and so the app yes you have to be there so if you're scattered in four counties um that's a little tougher to do from a logistical perspective but if you're at your home base um, and you have a goal of of getting some animal impacts some stock density um you can it's certainly an opportunity for you and it it, it doesn't take as much time and effort as you think yeah, but one of the things that, that I've heard throughout my my career, you you go someplace, say, well, this is this is thirty acre per cow country. This is what it is. That's what we're <laughs> yeah. And and um, I don't know I don't know how we get in that mindset. It's uh, each place is its own individual place. It's it's had its own management. It's it's had its own disturbances. It's had and and we don't it doesn't have to be all be thirty acre cow country in this county and and. and Really, I don't. Th I think a lot of times it's competition too. People want to, uh, yeah, you know. Oh well, he's doing thirty. I'm, we're we're we're, we're doing twenty five acres, uh, and so and because each place is, it has its own sets of challenges, and there's that place challenges. That's managers' challenges. So um, it's interesting when someone asks you what's the what's been the grazing history on this ranch. Yeah. There's ten thousand years of grazing history on most of this. Right? <laughs> yeah. These, yeah. And I mean, how do I, how do you say, how do you answer that? Answer question? that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> another going back to uh, uh, our previous uh, slides here, um, the monitoring piece uh, that you're talking about. One thing that uh, is, is a misconception that I think we all have is um, how how hard it is to monitor, how time consuming it is to monitor. But it's it's very vital. But one thing I like to drive home is it could be as simple as just taking photos. And I think you maybe mentioned that. And I like to tell folks, I was uh, like to look back at old photos with my wife or my kids. And I remember coming across one of the son's first birthday. It was only seven years ago. But the most important thing in my life, I had a hard time remembering what he looked like, you know, six years ago, seven years ago on his first birthday. So I think we feel like we know what our pastures looked like last year or the year before that. But I think all we remember really is truly is the highs and the lows, you know? And I think something as simple as that, as that photo point is invaluable. Yeah, it really is. Um, let's talk a little bit about biodiversity, um, Jeff. And uh, you know, that's near and dear to my heart, but how do we get away uh, from commercial f fertility or is that really something we need to do? Is that a goal that, hmm. that we need to have? You know, we often hear that might be one of those other misconceptions in regenerative agriculture that, you know, we can't use synthetic fertility. And, and not, I'm not standing up being a proponent of, 
of $900 a ton nitrogen. Um, that's one reason to get away from it. Um, this, but the point is, you know, we did an interesting study a few years ago where we looked at, we tried to build a case study and we, we, um, we split a ranch in two, um, had the same stocking rate on each side. We, we um, on one side, we left every gate open. We fed hay all winter um, and we, we used synthetic fertility at a, at a maximum uh, man, using nitrogen to increase production. On the other side, we, we went to one herd. We used cover crops and, and stock density, all the tools that we had. Um, and it was a learning experience. And then we tracked every dollar for five years. Um, we learned some pretty tough lessons. Number one, we were pretty hard on ourselves because we walked in there and said, we're not gonna feed any hay. So we're gonna back up on our stocking rate. Um, and I don't wanna feed any hay in the winter. I'm gonna make these cows work through it. So we did supplement pro crude protein. Um, but what ended up happening is we did have an increase in forage production and we didn't compensate by increasing our stocking rate when we had the opportunity to. And, and so that hit us from an economic perspective. But on the cropland side, um, when we were interseeding cover crops, we, we, did, we chose to go cold turkey on the nitrogen. And that was a mistake. Um, I think any time that we've been uh, we're working with a landscape that's, that's, that we've used some fertility. There needs to be a weaning process. Um, cold turkey uh, didn't necessarily work for us. Um, it, uh, it depressed production and, um, and then we, we had to supplement a whole lot more than we should have. So that also increased our bill. So I think some timely fertility um, would be helpful. Another thing is, um, Another thing is, you know, working with Ed Noble with, with a lot of soil sampling and everything, we, we were surveying and there's less people out there that actually take a soil test than I thought, like 10% um, were actually managing their pastures based on a soil test. And so uh, if you're not gonna do that, then, um, you know, I, I would absolutely recommend taking a soil test before you go spend the money on, on fertility. But, but I, I, it needs to be a weaning process. Um, we would have been much better off economically if, if we had, would had, uh, there's use some tools like, uh, right now we'll use the Haney test, uh, Regen Ag Lab in Nebraska, actually. Um, we'll, send a test to Lance Gunderson. He'll give us the, our, the Haney results back, which gives us um, some ideas on the active fraction of soil organic nitrogen uh, and uh, uh, the water extractable piece. And so we'll, we'll adapt that number to, to, to sort of make up whatever nitrogen or, or uh, uh, whatever nutrients that we want to add. So weaning yourself off of it, I think is the approach better than just cold turkey. Yeah, you know, uh, you start thinking about that nutrient cycle and all the biology that it takes below the soil to make that happen and what the biodiversity above the soil. And um, even, even in our introduced systems, uh, they didn't, uh, we didn't get dependent on uh, synthetic fertilizers in one year. Um, one, one change in management is, is not uh, going to bring that back to where that nutrient cycle is functioning uh, the way it was previously. So I, I, think, I think it's a good point. Cold turkey is a shock. To, to every, everything, everybody involved. Well, part of that too is that we're trying to manipulate and manage monocultures and yep. nature's abhors a, a, a monoculture. And so once we get some actual diversity in these systems and the, the, the cycling starts to work again, um, then, then we can be as productive or more um, in, in many situations without the crutches of synthetic fertility. But it, it's a bit of a process. This thing didn't get wrecked overnight and we're not gonna fix it overnight. No. Nope. And, uh, and it, you're right. Mother Nature does hate a monoculture. Most of your inputs and your time and your energy is beating the head against the walls to try to keep it that way. And it's, you know, I think uh, we're seeing that it's uh, work, working with her uh, maybe makes things a, a little bit easier from day to day. It, it, it might be a change in, in thought and that always brings on a little bit of challenges, but uh, it's something we couldn't, no, not, uh, you know, everybody can work through that. Okay, <clears throat> so to kind of wrap this up a little bit, how can producers um, analyze and 
and, and assess their grazing and what ground they're making, what, what's going on with their, with their grazing plan. All these, the regenerative or, or all these, managing all these processes, how are they gonna assess uh, what effect they're having? Well, you gotta keep good records. Um, and to me, the best record, um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, the, the power of observation, just getting out and seeing what's happening. And if you can't remember what happened last Tuesday, which is me half the time, you're certainly not gonna remember what your pastor looked like last year. So take good pictures, um, document them uh, through, uh, uh, there's a lot of different ways to document these pictures nowadays, but I mean, AgriWeb's a good, a good, oper a good platform. Uh, there's other grazing platforms out there that are good. Um, uh, AgriWeb uh, provides an, an opportunity to do some other things they don't. Um, and, but, but I would just encourage you to go out and look at them all and make your best decision. Um, I think, uh, but, but, but categorize that information because the, the, the way that, you know, if you, if you wanna make a good decision, it's gotta be an informed decision. And if you don't have the data to back up, to tell, the next generation or your wife why you're doing it <laughs> then um that's a problem uh we i heard uh, going back to kim earlier you know he's like the the hardest thing he's ever had to do is answer the question why or why are you doing that why'd you buy that why'd you spend that money on that for that reason well when you have to answer the why question then you have to better understand how you manage as a, as a whole and so having the data having the information um is the first step and keeping it up here is probably not the best answer yeah yeah J just because you uh feel like we're properly imp implementing whatever strategy um, right. that that we're, we're trying to employ unless you manage the outcome measure the outcome of that we really don't know uh, what, yep. what, what's happening okay so we've got about uh 15 minutes left and uh you know i know uh Jeff's got a lot of great information and we just saw tons of great information about what, what we got going on on these two properties. So we're gonna open it up to some questions. Anybody have any questions? Or we can go get something to drink. There's, yeah. there's some tea out there, I think. <laughs> Aaron, you talked about the AgriWeb Um, so I'm pretty well versed with technology as, as far as basic technology, you know, using Excel, Word documents, you know, creating PowerPoints, doing things like that. Um, and, uh, and then like with monitoring, using different apps. Um, but when I, when I got to the ranch, um, and really she had some Excel spreadsheets and, you know, we had Word docs and we had a heck of a lot of paper with a lot of scribbles, right? And so that's where it was getting for us is that, like, let's say for instance, just cow numbers. Now, even though they're on Excel, you know, you're, you're still gonna make that mistake of, um, you know, entering some data and trying to, you know, make a new row that she got the virus shield and so and so didn't get the virus shield because she's open and we're not gonna charge her. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that, that's why I was interested in going with something like that. So in the past, just a lot of Excel documents and, um, you know, and, and I would even put them on my, on my iPad so I could be shoot side, but you're still just scrolling, you know? So this, this to me is just something that's really well thought out of, you know, on, I, I was shown how to use a live session yesterday and I'm thinking, I literally just get to put, bang, she's bred you know, and she was dry and she got these shots and she's going to this pasture, you know, and it's down to the hours of, of when, um, you know, Max asked me, he's like, when did you move those cows? And I said, it was on the first. And he's like, Aaron, you know, when did you move the cows? I said, I, I don't know. We probably got in there at 1230. He's like, that's important. So that's how fine tuned this information is going to be for, for the ranch. But um, yeah, just bringing everything together. I know I'll still utilize those documents, Excel and, and those kinds of things, but to be able to then take that information and put it into a central location is really exciting to me. Yeah. 
Any others? Come on now. Yeah, Obviously. don't be scared. I got a question, Kobe. You <clears throat> you talked about um, in some ways you feel you feel like your family's kind of in the beginning of this journey and making some changes. What was uh, the biggest surprise? The biggest hurdle? The biggest uh, you know that you came across? And then I'm sure there was there was a change you made that you thought this is going to be hard. You know, and, and 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 what surprised you that it was not that hard and, and had some great benefits? So a little bit two two part question. Yeah. So I mean. A little bit more background. I don't know if I put it in the presentation. So we bought Ray Ranch, let's see, it would have been a few years before I was born in 1987. Um, bought it from the bank and, and really had the a, a blank sheet where we could start to grow into a, a grazing system. Um, I would say one of the the hurdles day to day, year to year is, I mean, there, with the way that we're designed with two employees across the entire operation, it is lane, you're always busy, but taking a step back from the day to day and really start planning on what's my goals in three years, five years, how can I, like what subdivision makes sense, which one's the most urgent and really thinking more strategic as opposed to tactical day to day wise. That That's a one thing that we wish we can do better. I mean, give us another three hours in a day, we might get there, but I don't <laughs> see the clock switching over anytime soon. But looking at, I mean, I think any producer that's looking at holistic management systems, that's looking at regenerative agriculture, it, it's, it's, it's a sliding scale. I mean, it starts a journey and you're, I still feel like we're at the beginning. I mean, who knows how far this journey goes. I think that we've done a great job managing the ecosystems to date over the last 30 years, but there's so much more that we can do to improve how we manage in those ecosystems. It's a never ending feedback loop. Um, I'm trying to think some negative experiences that we've had. Um, I would say one thing that, that Jeff pointed out, uh, like really knowing the soil types and, and kind of moving away from monocultures, I think is, is one thing that we continue to get dr driven home on our operation. So, we have, a, there's a ditch, an irrigation ditch, uh, and then a river, and in between that, there's sometimes a quarter of a mile, sometimes three quarters of a mile of distance, but really in that low-lying plain, there's uh, a unique application for sub-irrigation, and you know what, we tried planting a new stand of alfalfa in an area that we thought would work pretty well. Um, turns out it completely did not take to, to a monoculture alfalfa, and we're still having to deal with with that type of design. And I think moving forward, I mean, for us, like we grow cow alfalfa. It's, it's, I mean, grass alfalfa mix that kind of fits the protein need that we have on the <clears throat> ground. We're not looking to sell it. And I think that knowing that we don't need a, a strictly single monoculture and we can have some variation that will add to our pr productivity when it comes to our hay and supplement uh, design. Um, yeah, I'm, th I'm just kind of, shooting off the hip, but I would say that's probably a couple of good notes. Yeah, um, I, didn't, I didn't put you on the spot or anything. Oh, not at yeah. all. Uh, <laughs> but one cool thing that we've seen over those 30 years is, I mean, we've had the opportunity to grow and increase some acreage, but uh, starting off, we, we started off with five or 6,000, 6,500 acres was kind of when we really started off when I was old enough to remember, and we were running about 300 head maybe, and we added a couple more thousand acres of, of native grassland and looking over that those couple of decades let's call it 20 years we've gone for every our stocking rate has sustainably improved from let's say 20 acres to now we're, we're queuing in on that that 15 13 and i think it's pretty exciting I, any of our neighbors say that we're probably more heavily stocked overstocked than than what they would do but moving away from continuous grazing and into holistic rotational designs and consistently improving that. You may not notice much of a difference in year one, year two, year three, because the the rainfall fluctuates pretty drastically, but over the decades, you start to really see the dividends pay off. And I think that that's probably the coolest, coolest portion of our part of the journey. Yep. Y'all talk about livestock and wildlife primary uh, activities on that. I'd be curious about you. Some of these emerging markets are coming along as ranchers. What are y'all looking at when they're talking about some of these new opportunities with uh, ecosystem goods and services? Is that of interest? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, on the surface, everything's a, of interest, um, especially with the ESG credits, the idea of carbon credits, the idea of even, I mean, formalizing and, and marketing your, your hunting operations. I think that that's, all of that's exciting. Um, I think all of that's exciting. I, we've, as of right now, kind of trended toward a, like, slow adoption, slow consideration. Um, number one, I, I guess we're very multi, uh, we focus, we try to have a time horizon of, of 50 or 100 years in our family. So we wanna make sure that we're not doing any harm or we're not risking anything. So making sure that liability is minimal, making sure that it's a right person that might be leasing those hunting grounds um, or uh, the right counterparty is first and foremost what we consider. As we look forward to look at, as these ESG credits, as these, um, new opportunities arise. Absolutely, I think that it's a it's an exciting space. Uh, it's moving fast, and I feel like none of us feel like we have a, a good handle on it. So we look forward to it, and we're excited about the research that was really announced yesterday on on where those opportunities lie and what's what's the best approach for producers. Aaron? Yeah, um, I. I'm definitely interested and I haven't shared it with Anne too much yet, just because I'm a sponge, I'm learning all about it. Um, and my, uh, my daughter just uh, defended her professional paper today, actually, getting her master's at MSU. And um, her topic was, and she was in a thesis program and uh, partway through, she realized she really hated being in the lab. <laughs> And so for mental health reasons, you know, I, I encouraged her, you know, to, to do what you need to do and, and finish this up, but maybe don't follow that thesis track. But uh, it was on uh, carbon sequestration in semi-arid regions in uh, Montana on cool and warm season grasses. And so watching her presentation this morning was fascinating, you know, is bridging this gap where I know you know, some about the carbon cycle and, and the carbon to nitrogen ratio, I'm learning all the time. And so now Kendall has, has done this study and she also, you know, understands grazing and cattle and all that. And then just now got a job with Win at ACES, which is a uh, ranching coalition in Montana where she's gonna be kind of the coordinator, education coordinator for that. And so um, I don't wanna be late to the game, but just as Kobe said, I don't wanna jump the gun. It needs to be a decision for a ranch that doesn't bind us into something that might limit what the point of the ranch is, and that is to have a wonderful agricultural family-run operation. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to be done to bridge that gap between um, science and putting it into layman's terms that, that ranchers are going to understand and appreciate. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that it's just definitely on my radar and and want to keep a lookout for that and then on the hunting i think i'd mentioned that you know we've started to take on a few hunters um and and found some really neat guys that come from iowa and they're there to hunt it's not a killing spree you know i mean ryan sent me a text and he's like hey you had two cows out i checked their brand but they're back in you know those are the guys you want hunting on your land um, but it also we love that we have a corridor um, for some of these, you know, big bucks, you want to keep those genetics, you know, to hide out and find some place and, and not be bothered. So, Jeff, do you have any insight on the ESGs? I feel like you have pretty good pulse on quite a bit of things. Uh, <laughs> You're really smart. I, <laughs> I think that I, I think that the the door is about to get blown wide open on a lot of this stuff. There, it's it's literally. Um, it's kind of the wild west though uh there's not a there's no regulation on and i'm not to be clear i am not promoting regulation of anything um, <laughs> um but I, I i ultimately i think free market solutions is is where it needs to be i, I think if the government gets involved they'll probably mess it up um and so um but, but there's just a lot of players right now, and I'm glad that both of you guys said that you're cautiously optimistic, uh, meaning you're, op you're, 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 you're looking forward to the opportunity and, and willingness to participate in something like that. But be cautious right now, um, just, just because there's so many players. I, I think there's some good ones. Uh, there's gonna be one talking about uh, soil carbon markets in this session next. 
um, that that uh, they're they're doing as good a job as anybody. Um, but I, again, I think caution is is uh, warranted. Ed? Oh yeah, I, and on that note, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Rob. Uh, from the AgriWeb perspective, I mean, we're in, we're in three different geographies primarily, four or five, I guess, if you look at some smaller footprints, but you at the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom. And I think as we've seen different approaches in, the, in this industry and in the ESG space from all different geos, I see the UK or the, the EU still, I mean, that little divorce still has some things growing on it, but the EU has a different approach to higher regulation when it comes to mm -hmm. carbon and ESG credits than Australia does. Australia has a, a unique approach that's probably a hybrid approach. And then I agree with Jeff. I, I mean, I think in the US, we're still uh, pretty competitive. Uh, we still look at the market and think the market approach is, is pretty solid. And I see the market moving first independently of, of regulations and then give it 20, 30 years maybe, the, the government will probably catch on or something. The, re the reason I say be cautious is to me, the game will change when we can stack yep. these ecosystem services and you can get paid for carbon, water conservation, biodiversity, and then you can get the price point per acre or per ton or whatever the metric is to a point that actually helps you make a decision. Right now on the carbon stuff, um, uh, it's, it's paid per metric ton of carbon. Um, and so if they're paying you $20 a ton, you got to sequester a ton to get that $20 and you only get a portion of that 20. Now it's still a better market that was, that was out there two years ago because there wasn't one. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're really going to start moving the needle when we can start to stack ecosystem services in the future. Yeah, you know, and that's, like, yeah, that's, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Rob, sorry, I'm no, all over the place, no, but sorry. that's the exciting thing. I mean, I think from, the, the consumer perspective from um, the urban perspective, <laughs> carbon is the focus, which I think allows our industry to capitalize on a lot of momentum. All right, let's, let's look at carbon as a proof of concept, but yeah, really exactly. have these, these biodiversity, these watershed, these types of systems that can ultimately be bundled because proper management should be conscious of all of it. Oh, that's a great point, it's kind yeah. of the carrot. And So the question, if you didn't, you guys didn't hear, was the, is there is there a standardization being developed for, say, soil carbon or? or All these different things you were talking yeah, about. Uh, there's there's certainly some organizations out there working on it. Um, I, I wouldn't say that there's agreement. Um, there's you know, you like my plan or you like your plan. You know, there's a lot of different from a carbon perspective. There's there's a lot of different protocols out there, um, and those basically determine how and when, what's your method for sampling and all of those things. Um, <clears throat> but the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium, ESMC, is one that was developed to, uh, it, was, it was developed around a framework to, to ultimately stack services. Um, they've got some pilots around the country and they're supposed to go live next uh, January of 2022. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see how that works. The, the killer on all of this stuff is that if they can't get around two things, additionality and permanence, none of them are gonna work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from a, the reason this whole thing is happening is, is that there's carbon being emitted, right? And then we're wanting to sequester it into the ground, right? And so it's that delta that we're interested in. And so that's the carbon sequestration part. Um, but, but from a buyer's side, they want it to be additional meaning if you're already doing it, they don't want to pay you for it. They want you to change doing something. Well, if you're like Erin and she's been doing really good practices, why can't she be paid for the stuff she's already done? And so, and the, and the carbon she's already get put in the ground, or you, Carl. Um, and, so, and so they want you to start and, and you know, start from there. So anything new is what they, call, they, they term additional. And then permanence on the pollutant side, it's permanent, right? So they want the carbon to be permanent. Well, that's not how these systems work for one number two to me permanence 
is making sure the fifth generation of that rancher is still ranching, not some legal document. Um, so these. That's right. It's gone. Yeah. So that's some of the barriers. Yep. So we're at our we're at our time limit. Let's give these these panelists a round of applause. <laughs> you know, I, I think wherever you sit on that discussion, I think the take home in it, as long as you're managing your ecological processes, you put yourself in the position to take advantage of that if, if you so want. And I also wanted to state that uh, Getting your green from your from green, you know, of all the producers I've worked with and what I've talked to that have been managing ecological processes uh, for, for a while, they do it because they think it's the right thing to do, but it's also economically feasible for yeah. them, and that's part of the reason they're, they're doing it. Yeah, and hopefully that's good kind of appetizer for this next presentation. I think I'm going to stick around. Yeah, but there you go.